Welcome to Within the Chaos with your host, Rodney Shortridge, and co host, Robin Dalton. Uh, thank you, Tara and Holly, and the Vibe Radio Network. You can listen in by calling 516 387 1922 or on the web, connect. Link is tobtr.com forward slash 8424299. Also, you can check us out at www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Vibe Radio Network. And within the Chaos Link page to the Vibe Radio Network at www.viberadionetwork.org forward slash Within the Chaos. From deep within the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for listening within the chaos. My name is Rodney Shortridge, and I'll be a host tonight, along with my powerhouse co-host, Robin Dalton. Hey, everybody. Tonight, our special guest is Dr. Uh, O'Haines. Dr. O'Haines is an author and professor of English at Concord University. Located in Athens, West Virginia, where she has taught uh, writing and literature for 20 plus years. And also, I'd like to wish my granddaughter, Half Pint, a early, uh, very happy fifth birthday and tell you that Papa loves you. So, Robin, how was your week? <laughs> how was your week, girl? Well, it was very busy, so I'd like to give a big shout-out to my girl, Misty, for covering for me last week. I love her, and I'm so glad she's around. <laughs> she's so handy. <laughs> yeah, but, she is. She, she did a good job. She did a good job. Yeah, I mean, you know, with three teenagers, you never know what's going to come up, so it's good to have a standby. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it helps. <laughs> So, well, uh, you see, I lost it most of my week with you. <laughs> I've just been busy trying to trying to get caught up. We're so far, I'm so far behind on so much stuff. And spring's in the air, and I want to get outside. I want to go ahead and start planting my gardens, but it ain't time just yet. <laughs> We're co-gardening this year. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Yes, it sure is. I'll put your old butt to work. Well, I get the squash. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I think our guest is on, and uh, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our special guest, Dr. O'Haines. Uh, hello, Dr. O'Haines, and thank you for joining us tonight. How are you doing tonight? Hello, Rodney. I'm doing fine. <laughs> well, it, it's it's an honor to finally get to speak with you, Lee, is my daughter. That's my daughter, uh, Lee Shore. She she's uh, been a student of yours for. She says forever. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. Uh, we're we're gonna be sorry to admit, to look, have her go. Well, she's happy to get out of there. <laughs> yeah, That's, would be too. Well, yeah. uh, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm originally from Clintwood, Virginia, uh, and uh, my dad was a coal miner, and. Um, Somehow I got in college and and I've traveled around. I was married to a minister for a while and now I've I've been at Concord for the last twenty five years. And, wow. Uh, not much to tell. I'm I'm just a teacher. <laughs> oh well, 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 from some of your... just a teacher. <laughs> so some of the research and stuff of what Lee's told me about you. Uh, we're going we're going to delve right in and some of this good stuff in a minute because I'm excited to kind of corner you on one one topic that she told me that you that you go crazy over when people talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm teaching a class on it right now. Yeah. So, uh, what what set you on the path to becoming a, a writer and a professor? You just fall into it, or you just no nope. one day no. Um, my mom was a songwriter. Uh, uh, she grew up with Ralph Stanley. My sister lives about 10 minutes from Ralph Stanley, and she actually got some songs published, and she had me writing songs by the time I was three. 
and that got into poetry and uh, started writing fiction. So I've been writing all my life. <clears throat> and, so uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I was just going to ask you, um, so do you have any certain inspiration for your writings and teaching, or is it just you know something off the top of your head or something you feel deeply about? or? Well, it's usually something I feel deeply about, although I write everything, uh, songs, poems, fiction, nonfiction. Um, the only thing I don't write is plays, drama, but it's usually something I'm very much interested in. Like I, I wrote a nonfiction book about my cancer experience, but my poetry is very personal, and uh, songs... Uh, they just come to me. Actually, I stopped writing songs for many years. Um, academia kind of beat the rhyme out of me, and now I've got that back, and they're pretty easy to write. Uh, but those are the only things that I write that that don't have a uh, very personal meaning for me. Are there any certain people in your life that uh, you feel have influenced any of your writing? Oh, my goodness, yes. Um uh, I've been involved in a lot of writers' groups and uh, um, bigger groups like the uh, Appalachian Writers Association, uh, Appalachian Authors Guild, and I've gone to meetings and conferences for years, and I couldn't name all the people who have been influential in helping me with my writing. and, um, And, of course, before that, there were teachers who encouraged me. I don't think I could really name all of them. <laughs> well, uh, I, I know you've uh, been doing research on global warming and in light of ancient mythology. Can you explain uh, to everyone what that means? Well, yes, and uh, um, I hate to say it, uh, but on this point, Trump is somewhat right. Uh, global warming is a natural event. We are adding to it. We're making it worse. But the Earth has been warming for uh, at least 100, maybe a couple hundred years because we're at the end of the precession cycle, which lasts 26,000 years. And okay. at the end of that, you usually get a huge catastrophe and start over. And uh, so one way or the other, uh, we're facing major catastrophes. Of course, we're having them now with the flooding and the earthquakes and the tsunamis and and all that. Uh, and the only thing the news will tell you is that this is a new normal and it's going to get worse. Well, it is going to get worse. And I don't know if we'll see a total extinction event or not some people are some of the scientists are saying yes we will um that we can't tell but we are at the end of the precession cycle and unfortunately when 2012 came and left people kind of forgot because the the world didn't end in december 2012 so people thought okay the world's not ending but we're actually still it takes a long time for the end of a 26,000-year cycle to end and start back up again. Okay. On that on that note, uh, for people like myself who's not uh, <laughs> always, you know, very educated on stuff like this, uh, could you explain a little bit about procession cycle? What exactly is that? Well, it... Um, you all know about the constellations? Yes. yes. You've seen the constellation circle? Usually 12 constellations. Actually, there are 13. And you don't see the 13th until you're uh, approaching the end of a precession cycle. The 13th is the serpent bearer, and we were able to see it in uh, 2011. So <clears throat> it's one of the reasons that we're as humans, afraid of uh, 13. (laughs) Um, But that uh, cycle 
it takes 26,000 years for those constellations to move all the way around in their procession. That's why it's called a procession cycle. And, um, of course, everybody's aware of the stars and the constellations. We know there are stars up there, but um, in all of the old mythology, um, I was looking, I started about 20 years ago, I was studying American Indian legends and uh, because I teach American Indian literature as well here at Concord, and I started reading their flood stories and their other myths about creation and all that, and they were exactly like the Bible. And that's when I started looking and digging, and I can't stop digging because it's so interesting. This topic is so interesting. Uh, 72% of the world's stories of creation contain a catastrophe, a flood. And fortunately, the American Indians remember more about this because they were an oral society, so they kept more of the information. The other people of the world, um, when the Roman church came along, they destroyed a lot of the information when they burned the um, Alexandria Library and killed off a lot of the Gnostics who uh, religiously copied all of the knowledge that they could find. But there's enough still out there. Once you read all these stories from all of the cultures, every culture has a flood story. And science has poo-pooed this for years. But... There uh, there was a huge flood at the end of the Ice Age. That was the last catastrophe. And that's probably the flood story that's in all of the myths. And when I read those and I went back to the Bible, then I really understood the Bible. The Bible is all about this. It starts... Uh, are you still there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it starts, and most people don't notice this, but I'm all about words. Words have always fascinated me, and I don't want to just read a sentence. I want to know what's in it, you know, what's there. I see things that other people don't see, and once I'd read those myths and I came back to the Bible and read it again, the very first chapter of a creation of the sons of God And then he tells them to go and replenish the earth. Well, you don't replenish something unless it was wiped out before. And I found out that there there have been five extinction events since the earth was formed. Three of those humans were involved in. And the, the myths of all... And by the way, the word myth in ancient days meant ultimate truth so all of these stories being very much similar to each other has got to mean something and uh, in the then in the second chapter of the bible there's another creation that's where adam comes in if you've ever wondered why it says that god made people and then in the next chapter chapter he made adam well there was this destruction in between there That was the first one. Then comes the flood, which is in Genesis also. And then a lot of the Bible talks about for when the preset at the end of the precession cycle. And of course then Revelation is all about the destruction. A lot of people don't read Revelation because it's hard to understand, but once you read these other myths and you go back and read it, then it's like, aha! Um, it's just so fascinating. Um, well, what's your next question? Yeah. <laughs> well, where you're, you were talking about uh, God creating Adam and Eve, and they were people before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, and you're talking about the uh, procession being every 26,000 years. 
and most Christians or people of faith, faith believe that uh, the earth is only 6,000 years old. How, how, does, how does that timeline match with what you're saying? Because it, the great flood that of Noah's time that we all know, uh, that wasn't 26,000 years ago, was it? No, it was actually 13,000 years ago. That was the flood at the end of the Ice Age. Um, it, see, even our history books, the literature books that I teach out of here at Concord say that civilization didn't come about until uh, Samaria and that area about 6,000 years ago. Well, it's simply not true. Another thing I've been studying is all the new archaeology that's been uh, going on around the world. They are digging up cities that we didn't know were there. Uh, they just found a, one off the coast of India a few years ago uh, that is sunk in the sea. Carbon dating on it is no less than 30,000 years. And this was a concrete city with pillars and statues and the whole nine yards. So, wow. um, oh yeah, and, and I could tell you a whole lot more places that they're uh, digging up, and they're finding that in uh, over in the uh, in the Middle East area, there are layers and layers of cities underneath. You know, they they'll do archaeology uh, on one city, and then they find out that there was another city underneath it, and under that, underneath that was another city. So, uh, and uh, evolution is a lie as well. Uh, and a lot of very brave uh, doctors and scientists are coming for us and saying that it is. Uh, one thing that they didn't want us to know was that uh, humans have been around longer than they think we have. Another thing is that we didn't evolve, we made it. Uh, they left out the nookie factor. <laughs> <laughs> there were uh, lots of different races, and I've got pictures and of skulls and all this. Of, um, and there's a really, really good book by a scientist who is saying this very thing. She's saying, you know, there were all kinds of different types of people on the earth. There were big people. There were, you know, dwarfs. Uh, they found the Hobbit, which was a tiny little person. There were lot. There were lots of little races of small people. There were big people, um, and they made it. That's what changed the genes. And you know, those of us went with some common sense could figure this out. Like they found this, uh, what they called a tongue child. It was half human and half ape. Well, the, the evolutionists said, oh, look, it's halfway in between evolving into a human. Now, if we found a dog and it was half German Shepherd and half Chihuahua, we would not say, hey, look, evolving into a German Shepherd or, or the other way around. No, we would say that they made it. And so uh, evolution is a bunch of junk. And uh, when I think they don't want us to remember um, what actually happened to the earth that we start over because the, uh, the greedy people wouldn't be able to get us to buy all the stuff that they want us to buy. And, and we wouldn't buy into this idea that civilization is a wonderful thing. Wow. Well, uh, well you were talking about uh, uh, there were people here before Adam and Eve. Uh, yeah. Who? who, who it. Because you kind of got me a little confused here. Because who I, were these people and and you know, were they the giants that uh, a lot of uh, uh, different cultures believe in? And uh, also, apparently, there were some archaeologists that found bones of giants. You know, anywhere from 
15 foot. I've read somewhere to 28 foot tall. And why did God destroy them to create Adam and Eve? I mean, that's where I'm kind of getting a little confused on. Well, um, it didn't say that God destroyed them. Uh, but it fits if you read that chapter. A, a lot of stuff was cut out. And there were giants. Uh, there have been skeletons. A lot of those were fake. Uh, some of the skeletons that they found were uh, were rigged. But there have been skeletons. We now know. And uh, let me see. Let me get to my looking at stuff on my desktop here that will help me remember. There's so much stuff, it's hard to remember all this stuff. Um, oh, not that one. Let's see. There, um, they have found uh, skeletons as far back as 4.4 million years old of human beings who walked upright. Wow. 4.4 million. Um, I forget what university. I can't find it right now. Uh, They're studying those bones now. They were found in Africa. So uh, basically science is going to have to rethink. uh, And they're never going to find that missing link. Uh, Well, I'm going to go ahead. I'm sorry. (laughs) Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, you were talking about there was a lot of things that were cut out of the Bible. Is that um, is that what you would consider the lost books of the go- you know, of the gospel? And you know, do well, these lost books configure in the mythology of the cultures? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you really want to study this stuff, you've got to go back and read all the lost books of the Bible, like uh, the books of Enoch, the books of Adam and Eve. You find out that Adam was told by by God that there was going to be a flood and then there was going to be another extinction later. Um, and Enoch was Noah's grandfather. It was actually uh, Enoch who went to Noah and told him to build the ark. Uh, he was the one who had the dream. And sure. Enoch, yeah. And actually... Uh, Enoch's line was kin to the, uh, and, and Enoch spells it out. Uh, he says that these, he called them watchers. The Bible calls them angels. He called them watchers. Uh, came to help humankind, and they were there were ten of them, and they were supposed to help humans uh, learn the good things, you know. And they were corrupt themselves. They corrupted the humans, taught them about gold and silver and greed and vanity and all these things. And uh, they were the ones who decided that they were going to take wives of the humans. I say humans because I don't know who these watchers were, but they had names and they could obviously mate with the humans. And he doesn't call them angels. He calls them watchers. Um, and you, you have to wonder who they were and what were they watching. But anyway, they did mate with the humans and produced these giants were hybrids. If you take one species and mix it with another species, what do you get? You get a hybrid. Anybody who knows anything about horticulture knows that. You know, you've seen hybrid roses. They're stronger, more robust, um, unique. Um, so, uh, and by the way, the sin in the Old Testament in Genesis was not the humans. It was the watchers. It was the watchers and then the giants the hybrids if you read the book of Enoch you find out that um, they they were bigger they were stronger and they started devouring everything and they were corrupt and they took everything and they were killing the humans 
and so they had to be stopped and and be done away with. It would be kind of like having a bunch of Terminators running around here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so so no, they were no. killed. It was the Watcher's sin and the giant sin, not the humans. So uh, that was one reason they wanted to cut that out of the Bible. Do you think the Watchers were aliens? Uh, excuse me? I said, do you think the Watchers could possibly be an aliens? Well, counting it, uh, because we're going to Mars and other places and we've been to the moon and and actually science is now saying that Venus used to have our atmosphere that Earth has now and it was destroyed by greenhouse gases uh, global warming, the same thing we're having now and we're looking for other planets to go to when we destroy Earth so why couldn't this have happened before? And in my studies, I have found that these old civilizations that were destroyed, they were as technologically advanced as we are, if not more so, because they built the Great Pyramid. We cannot build it today. Uh, the, The Great Pyramid was not built by... The Egyptians, it's older than that. They've now proven that the the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx have had much water damage. So there's a possibility that it came through the flood. Um, wow. Oh, let me go back to the, uh, the constellations because this is fascinating. In all of these myths, in, in, in a great many of the myths, and especially the Bible, there is mentioned... Uh, four horses of the apocalypse. And they're called different things in in the different myths. What they are is four of the constellations. Uh, They're talked about in Isaiah. uh, Let me see. You look at all of the places in the Bible where they're talked about. And the two main constellations that are involved in the end of the precession cycle is the bull and the lion. The bull, of course, is Taurus. The lion is Leo. The bull is in the lead, and that's why in the over in the Middle East and all the archaeology places that they're examining, there are bulls everywhere. Uh, there's the, the Minotaur and... Um, there was even a religion of killing the bull at one time. Um, and it went out. It was in uh, Rome. That was uh, uh, Mithras. And the other constellations are there in that Mithras uh, sculpture and the story. There's the uh, the bull. There's the lion, and there's a scorpion which is Scorpio, and in the old, old uh, cultures, that constellation was an eagle. And there's a man, which is Aquarius. There's a fourth one that's involved in that. I mean, a fifth one, excuse me. In 2012, when the calendar ended, the Mayan calendar, we saw the uh, the lining up of these four it makes a cross in the sky. Oh. Uh, of course, we don't see it. You'd have to know what you were looking for. But it makes an equal arms cross in the sky. And all of these cultures, uh, it, everything's four. There are four epochs in the procession cycle, four stages. Uh, there are four constellations involved in the the destruction and starting over and look at the Bible scriptures here. The Bible's got this all through it. Um, and uh, also a lot of the the stories talk about uh 
as the Bible does, that when everything is destroyed, when Israel is totally destroyed, God leaves a remnant. When Babylon was destroyed, God left a remnant. That means a small portion of the population will survive. Um, All through the Bible, there are these beasts that they talk about. Uh, There's four beasts. Uh, There are four, let's see, in... In Isaiah sure and one of the one of the books talks about the when he goes up in the chariot to see God he sees these uh, four creatures that have wheels and they move and they've got four heads one is a man one is a lion one is a bull and one is a I'm not sure the Bible may use eagle it's either eagle or scorpion Probably an eagle in the Bible, but it's the same thing. The ancients used to call Scorpio an eagle. Uh, when these line up, they only line up at the end of the procession cycle. You can see them across. They make the equal arms cross. And uh, in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, the disciples asked Jesus. Jesus was teaching this. It's one of the reasons he was killed. The disciples ask him, what should we look for uh, to know that it's uh, we're nearing the end of the cycle? And he repeats the old stuff that uh, was taught before that the Egyptians knew and the Sumerians knew that there were there are four stages to humankind. After uh, destruction, there's only a remnant of humans, and it's paradise for that first epoch because there's so few people, they're just concentrating on surviving. Then in the second epoch, they start making civilization. They start gathering into villages and making groups, and uh, then they start seeing differences among the groups. Well, that group's not like us, uh, and uh, wars start to break out. Then in the third epoch, to stop the wars and the fighting and killing and and uh, stuff like that, they create religion. Then the last epoch, the Hindus call the Kali Yuga. That's when all hell breaks loose. Uh, there's nothing to stop it because there are too many people. And right. people have gotten so corrupt, and that's what we're in right now, the Kali Yuga. Uh, if you turn on your TV, just just turn it on, and you'll hear of another murder, another shooting. It's ridiculous. Uh, okay. So, and uh, so the disciples ask him, to him, how will we know when it's the end of the age? And most people think, that they were talking about the end of the world. No, they said the end of the age, and Jesus said it too. And he said the same thing that the old old, uh, text said, that it would be so bad that brother would be against brother, daughter would be against mother, uh, et cetera, et cetera. People would be totally unruly. Wow. See. Okay. Well, I okay. know you've also said that the stuff people made religions of is pure knowledge, creation energy, quantum physics, and et cetera. So what does this have to do? I mean, what all does this have to do, do you believe, with global warming? Oh, well, uh, the Earth naturally heats up at the end of the precessional cycle. Of course, the Earth has a pattern of warming and cooling and all that. But at the end of the precession cycle, the earth warms. What's happening right now in the in the Arctic, the ice is melting. You know, you see the polar bears on the little chunk of ice and all that stuff. And our oceans have already risen three feet or possibly more. 
And this is the same thing that happened 13,000 years ago. Now, it can happen at the middle of a cycle, and evidently it did at the end of the Ice Age. And, uh, of course, that's when the dinosaurs became extinct also. And they're saying that uh, at that time a, a comet or something also hit the Earth. When we're at the end of the cycle, we have to go across the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. And it leaves us vulnerable to all kinds of uh, comets, asteroids, uh, you name it. And there and there's a black hole there as well. We don't know what we're facing. But in the past, uh, from the stories of different cultures, uh, they saw some pretty scary stuff when they crossed the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. Wow. Well, I know, oh, and by I know the way, you. I was talking about Jesus, and uh, he said, he said, when you see my sign in the heavens, you'll know it's the uh, beginning of the end. Not the end, but the beginning. And and we did see that uh, equal arm cross, the four beasts lined up in 2012, and there's a fifth one. When that happens, Sagittarius aims his arrow at Earth. And uh, it's in a lot of the old texts. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, you've, you've spoken about ancient civilizations and how many different ancient civilizations. Um, uh, how many do you think have existed, and what do you think is the oldest civilizations that uh, have predated what scientists know today? How many civilizations? Yeah how, well, uh, yeah, how many ancient ones do you think of, that we don't know of? Well, we know scientists do know that there have been five extinctions and that uh, humans went through uh, three of them. And there had to have been at least one of those extinctions that uh, demolished a lot of very prominent civilizations that were um, very brilliant. They had a lot of knowledge. The Great Pyramid is built on the uh, precept of Pi. We didn't discover Pi until the 20th century. They knew all of this stuff about the heavens. And all of the, the really weird things around the earth that people are studying, like the Great Pyramid, um, Stonehenge. There are all kinds of uh, pyramids and circles uh, that archaeology is studying that they don't understand exactly what they were meant for. They're markers. Well, they uh, a lot of them, like Stonehenge, marks the precession cycle, the... the um, marks the sun at rising and setting. And we've just assumed that a lot of those things were religious-based. And if you look at the religions around the world, the symbols are... I think, Rodney, I sent you that thing that I... Uh, the YouTube thing. Yeah. Did you see all the religious symbols on the front of it? I sure did. Yeah. They all mean the same thing. Go back and look at them. They all have derivatives of four. Even the I Ching, it's eight. And that's sacred geometry as well. Sacred geometry plays into this. Um, it's fascinating because uh, it's all in, in uh, old met metrology. And uh, if you know anything about music, music follows those uh, numbers as well, and uh, pyramids are extremely uh, important because the trinity in sacred geometry is a circle, a square, and a pyramid, and the pyramid is the most powerful because it is the element of life. A uh, 64 tetrahedron grid, which is 4 times 4 times 4 
uh, it's elements of four up to 64, that is life. You have to have a 64 tetrahedron grid for life. And if you can, if you get to look at uh, an embryo when it implants itself in the womb, it is a perfect 64 tetrahedron grid. All of those uh, religions were sacred geometry and uh, the the stuff of what life is, really. Wow. Well, I know I've, I've read that a couple found a hammer that was embedded in stone, uh, and they took it to some scientists to date it. Well, they dated it over a million years old. Do you think it's possible that, you know, humanoids or human-like people or civilizations are a million years old or older? Oh, yes, absolutely. (coughs) They're buried. Yeah, eventually, if if we're here long enough, they'll dig up some more of it. Uh, They found computers. Mm -hmm. They found a computer on a ship. And they found one uh, and uh, dug up one near a pyramid somewhere over in in, uh, Egypt. Uh, And they (coughs) mention these things in the news, and then they go away, and they never tell us about them again. And you wonder. uh, And the Great Pyramid itself, not only is it built on pi, but it is perfect. And I've talked to some of the engineers and uh, geologists that went over and examined it, and uh, the blocks of the Great Pyramid were machine-tooled, and so were some of the statues at some of the pyramids. So uh, that just bl- that blows your mind, you know, that those could be machine-tooled, and you can't get a credit card between them. They're so perfect. Uh, a lot of the pyramids, even here in North America, some of the buildings and pyramids that, that were built of stone were machine tooled, and they are so precise that yeah, you like, get yeah. Yes, Go like ahead. South America, there's some uh, uh, what uh, Puma Puka and yeah. some some other uh, uh, cities that <laughs> they're machine tooled and they're like. Supposedly dated seventeen, eighteen thousand 18,000 years ago, right when we came out of the Stone Age. And I know that's just it's fascinating to know that these people are building stuff with technology that really we can't understand today. Yeah, and let me, let me really blow your mind. One of the texts that I have the students read for this class is... Uh, the Asian people, their sacred text, they don't let them out a lot, but they have some stories that are really, really long. Their historical is very much like the Bible. They're part history, you know, and uh, uh, and they glorify the, the warriors and whatnot in them. But it's very clear in this text, say that they have a huge war and they had a weapon that was not to be used, but they used it anyway. And let me see what civilization this this is. Uh, It is from India. It is uh, from the Maha... uh, No, I won't even try to, to... But it's the synopsis of the great epic of India. And they used this terrible weapon, and it killed millions immediately. And the people who survived, uh, their hair came out, and uh, their food was unfit to eat. Uh, They were sterilized. The women could not have children. Uh, The death toll was 6 million. Uh, what was that weapon? Sounds like a nuclear warhead. Exactly. Exactly. 
and wow. the, it they promised after that um never to use this weapon again uh and it goes on to say that the, the man who prizes gold and dirt equally is happiest they they find out that civilization's not all it's cracked up to be um and with all its wars and problems and things and um yeah, when you read that it's when I first read that I was like, Oh my god, you know, this was a civilization of the past and it doesn't say um it was in Sanskrit originally. It doesn't say when. We don't probably it was in the last uh before the last before the Ice Age. Wow. Well, but, um, well, well, do you think uh, any of these ancient civilizations, do you think they had anything to do with the climate change? Well, I'm studying that and I'm going to ask my students because a lot of the a lot of the stories uh do credit humans for doing something wrong. Uh, the Bible, it's sin, uh, it's sex, and in a lot of stories it's sex, and, and I've been given that a lot of thought. Was it sex, or was it that they had too many people? Because that's what they're saying now. Uh, one of the reasons that we're overtaxing the earth is that we keep having people. And a lot of these stories uh, in the... The Sumerian story, the Egyptian story, the gods destroyed the people. I mean, yeah, destroyed the people because there were too many people. The gods couldn't go to sleep because of all the noise the humans were making. Hmm. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, other places, the American Indians, some of theirs say that it was uh, sex. But some of them don't. Some of them say that, uh, in fact, prophecy rock, uh, some of their prophecies were written on rocks in uh, pic- pictoforms, pictographs. Uh, uh-huh. Hopi prophecy rock says that we will have, uh, that this will happen. It, it prophesies that this will happen and that we will have a choice. And it, it shows the American Indians, and it shows the white man coming. And then it uh, there are two roads that they can go down. If they go down the road of civilization and war, we will all die. If they go down the path of peace and recognizing that all things are connected and, and uh, loving nature and going back to the simple life, then we might survive. So, yeah, I I do think humans have something to do with it. I think we tip the scale with this. Well, get back uh, to ancient civilizations. I I don't know if you know anything about Michael Dillinger. Uh, He's researched ancient civilizations in South uh, Africa and has a theory and some evidence that uh, some ancient civilizations mined gold in South uh, Africa re- region using different types of technology that even the engineers today can't explain. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And could this possibly be, because in his theory, he also includes that it may have some uh, uh, ancient alien uh, manipulation uh, as far as our human DNA uh, to help them mine the gold, and that could possibly be the reason why humans migrated out of Africa. I know that's a loaded question, but you no, know, I, I understand it because one of the oldest myths from um, is about a king Artahasis, and actually Moses took his his works. Moses didn't actually invent the Bible. Uh, he grew up in the Sumerian area, and he knew this this story, and he knew the story of Gilgamesh. But the story of Atrahasis 
talks about two types of gods, the upper gods and the lower gods. The lower gods were doing all the work. And what they were doing sounds like major physical labor, and it, it sounds a lot like mining. And they did, then they decided to create humans. And from all of the things that I've read, I think possibly they were doing it either through mating with the humans to create this uh, new species or, or, you know, a cross between the two, and they were to take over the work. Or they did it through um, population of genes. And, yes, I do think that they were that intelligent uh, because a, a lot of people have speculated that they were doing... Uh, manipulating uh, DNA and uh, because they were experimenting with uh, animals and humans and um, even some of the lost books of the Bible like the ancient book of of Jastar I can't pronounce it in that book uh, there was a person who was half, half man and half animal and so they might have been experimenting to see what kind of race they could come up with to do their work. And I, I've read some of the books about the ancient mining, and they might be by that person you were talking about. Um, I don't know. But who those gods were, I don't know. Who, and there were, But there were two types, the lower gods and the, and the upper gods. Well, the so yeah. gods. Yeah. I guess what he was uh, trying to get at is why does humans have this fascination with gold? We've had this fascination with gold for uh, a very long time. Mm-hmm. And, and and he was trying to make the point that, I guess, that some other beings came here and were mining the gold because they were needing it. And all of a sudden, humans, because... It's in our DNA. I guess in our makeup, we want gold. We love it. We like to see it. It, it has a lot of great properties. Uh, but it, 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 to me, it makes me wonder, you know, why? Why is gold so valuable to humans at that time? Yeah, well, there's several stories that give us that impression that either they were mining gold and the humans got the impression that this stuff was the most important stuff ever. Or in the book of Enoch, those watchers taught the humans to want gold, and they weren't supposed to. It's kind of like the watchers, to me, it sounded like that they were kind of like uh, uh, the, you know, the Star Trek series, you know, they were to not influence the people, just watch from afar and not get involved. It sounds like the watchers were supposed to be like that, but they disobeyed and got the humans involved in what they were doing. So, And part of that was gold. So, and a lot of people speculated that if aliens were involved, then they may have been coming to Earth to get minerals for something they needed on their planet. Mm -hmm. Just like right now, we're going to Mars to see what it has for us. Uh, So why why should we think that an advanced civilization wouldn't have been doing that millions of years ago? Yeah. Well, uh, I I want to get back to the climate change real quick because we're running out of time, but... I know your father was a coal miner and uh, uh, and uh, and worked at coal mines for, and I worked at coal mines for uh, a short period of time. Uh, many generations of men and women and children in our area have been touched some way by someone in the coal industry. Right. Do you think Do you think it's time to stop burning coal to produce electricity due to the carbon it produces, and is it being uh, as it's being pumped in the atmosphere, or do you think it's time for clean, cheap, renewable energy to help stop you know, so much of the carbon and other toxins being produced as we put up in the air 
the water and the land because uh, it's affecting their breathing, you know, the water we drink and the food we eat. Now that one's a loaded question. <laughs> well, uh, I'm torn on that because, and my I, I've had my one or two composition students writing about this very thing. I gave them the climate change uh, topic, and about half of them migrated to the coal situation. And I asked them to write to a politician, and there are still some possibilities for coal. Uh, if we could perfect clean coal technology, um, some scientists are saying it's it's too late because we've with the CO2 we've already crossed the 400 level in tons T O N N E S uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, people and animals and, and uh, fish in the ocean. Uh, start to struggle after 350, and we've crossed the 400 level. Some scientists are saying it's too late. We can't go back. The oceans are so warm, the coral reefs are dying. Um, with politics the way it is, I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm concerned about the environment, and coal is bad. Uh, West Virginia is one of the worst places for asthma ever. And uh, especially mountaintop removal. Uh, I have protested against mountaintop removal because it's a a cheap, down, dirty way to get coal uh, that really hurts the environment. But the deep mining, we've done that in many different parts of the world for many years. If we could get the clean coal technology, what opened my eyes while my students were writing about this, I was studying it, uh, looking at the things that they were looking at, and what I learned was uh, uh, distressing about our politicians and the EPA. If the EPA is so concerned about the environment, why is it that they're shutting down coal, but at the same time they're not putting uh, bigger regulations on the auto industries? We bailed out the auto industries because the the second worst polluters are the gas fed automobiles. Uh we bailed out the auto industries, we bailed out Chrysler twice. What's Chrysler doing? They're making bigger automobiles. They're making trucks so big I can't even drive one of those big rams. Well, uh, I, I hate to, I hate to interrupt you, but we got like a minute left so Oh, okay. I'll get to the to the gist of it. I'm concerned that because when the president first came on board, he was all for clean coal technology, and within months he changed his mind and did a double flip. And what I found was that the only thing that would rival clean coal technology, if we got it right, would be nuclear power. It would actually be better than nuclear power, which is very dangerous in a lot of different ways. So uh, I'm not going to say we should stop coal for the environment because I think there's some political junk going on behind the scenes. Progressive presents Mind Flowness with Flow. Before you lie is a beautiful meadow. In that meadow, Progressive Direct has placed its auto insurance rates alongside those of competitors. You select the lowest rate and feel a great sense of calm. A great sense of calm. Compare Progressive Direct rates with competitors' rates so you can rest easy. Visit Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy.